Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we are talking about Malachi, or at least about a theme that Malachi talks a lot about. Um, we're actually going to be talking about tithing. Um, there's a huge problem in the book of Nehemiah, which we will run through the narrative of ending a sentence with a preposition is my specialty. Well, now, in chapter 13 of Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah has taken a leave of absence, and when he gets back, he finds that a number of things have not been tended to, and we're going to look at just one in particular. This is verse 10 of chapter 13. And I perceive that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. And I made treasurers over the treasuries, Shemaiah the priest and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites, Padiah. Next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Methaniah, for they were counted faithful. And their office was to distribute unto the brethren. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out all my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. Crucial to the success of the Restoration Covenant was having a functioning temple and functioning pastors, men who taught the Word of God. Strange thing about pastors, they have to be paid and really? I mean, it seems like it's something they should do out of the goodness of their hearts. I mean, if their heart's really in it, they should consent to be at least underpaid, don't you think? Underpaid, yes. I mean, they don't need to be paid as well as everybody else. They're pastors. Their lot in life is to not have much, right? Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't want them, you know, tempted, falling into a love of money. Exactly. Tempted by avarice. The Bible says they're not supposed mm -hmm. to to be greedy of filthy lucre. So let's make sure of that by not paying them very much. I mean, that seems pretty foolproof to me. And yeah. no, no logical issues or moral problems I can see with it. No, yeah, the gospel will uh, perk along quite fine <laughs> by these. Okay, uh, let's be clear. That was all sarcasm. <laughs> Please correct, do yes. not confuse. It, it, the be confused, dear listener. is <laughs> that not everybody got that it was sarcasm. Uh, two examples out of my own past. Uh, my pastor, when I was a kid, told the story, actually, I think his wife told the story, of how one morning she served bacon to her children. And the oldest, who was probably four or five or something, looked at it and said, what's that? It's bacon. What? She had never been able of, to afford to buy them bacon for breakfast to that point. Um, we all know, I think, a um, young man whose grandson of uh, a pastor who's now gone to be with the Lord. And every time the subject came up in, in my class when he was there, I turned to him and say, does this sound familiar? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's when uh, church members and even deacons turn to the, your, your pastor and say, you know, you should be able to get along without a lot of money. God will take care of you. The rest of us have to work for our living. <laughs> right, because I <laughs> the pastor's not working, right? No, no. I mean, he has. The, there's the story of a little kid who decided when asked, well, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" I want to be a pastor. Why is that? So I only have to work once a day or once a week. <laughs> um, Incorrect. <laughs> that is so very like a child's perspective. That a lot of people never outgrow it. It seems. Yeah. Uh, These are kind of horror stories. They are. Um, they would be more horrific if they, most horror stories are made up. These mm -hmm. weren't. In my original article, I have a quote from a gentleman named Mike Holmes, who I do not know otherwise. The title of the article was, it was published in uh, 2013, What Would Happen If the Church Tithed? And the quote I salvaged was this, Christians, and this is in 2013, Christians are giving only at 2.5% per capita. 
Mm. Well, during the Great Depression, they gave it 3.3%. One of Those the- are both a lot less than 10%. <laughs> I'm just going to point out. Okay. Yeah, you can point that out. And during the Great Depression, you might at least think people had a reason. Of course, they were making a lot less money, so 10% would be a lot less money as far as that goes. <laughs> But you know what? During the Great Depression, pastors still had to eat. But pastors still have to eat. One of the odd spectacles of our generation is those relatively few pastors who do make thousands and thousands, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. People They have mansions and they have jet planes. Their receiving money seems to attract more money. But most faithful pastors struggle to get along and to leave enough support for their widows after they're gone. This this is a real issue. Mm. There's a, a passage in Deuteronomy 8, which I've written about, and it speaks of God prospering us, giving us money, giving us wealth, to establish his covenant with us. And at first glance, that sounds really weird. You need money to establish the covenant? Isn't it all grace in the blood of Christ? Yes and no, because who's going to go tell people about grace in the blood of Christ if you don't pay them? Where are God's people going to get together to worship? They probably need at least chairs to sit on. They may need a few bucks for that. Most of us in this pampered 21st century want a real building and air conditioning and central heating. Hardly necessary, but we've gotten used to it. And then there's publishing and printing Bibles and Christian literature, um, Sunday school materials, hymnals. Uh, having uh, a computer system, speak or speaker. So there's all kinds of things that we think we need, and many of them we kind of do, <laughs> if we're going to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Yeah, and it and, is a, a valid point that you don't want people to become pastors because of the money. You don't yeah. want them to do it out of a uh, love of filthy lucre. But the tithe as a mechanism short circuits that. You know, if you're being paid the average of what 10 families make yeah. in your congregation, you're, you're not going to be the one that's like, hmm, how come your butter's so rich on your bread? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the interesting thing is that in Israel, there were 12 tribes that were tithing to one. So the average, if Israel was faithful, if Israel was ever faithful, the average Levite would probably be making a little bit more than average. Yeah. At least there was a built-in safety net there. There's nothing in Scripture that suggests that God expects pastors to be poor. On the other hand, Paul says many times that he's willing to be poor, that he can abase and he can abound, uh, that God will supply all his needs, and pastors need to trust God. And yet, mm -hmm. we need to take care of our pastors. Well, yeah. and I also think it's important that we remember Paul was traveling to multiple different churches mm -hmm. to establish new ones. He wasn't someone from the community right. that was, or even someone from out of the community who was established there right? and expected to be there week in and week out, day in and day out, mm -hmm. caring for the needs of people. It's like for, for Paul's situation, and that's not to say that no pastor should follow Paul's example, obviously. But um, for those particular people, it makes more sense to pay them for the labor that they're doing day in and day out, just as Paul received pay from some of his um, longer distance mm -hmm. disciples uh, for his missionary work. Um, but it, it does make more sense for Paul to be willing in his role as an apostle, as, you know, essentially an itinerant minister mm -hmm. to be willing to do that because it was about bringing the gospel to people who had never had it before. So if you went to a place and said, by the way, before I give you salvation, I want you to pay me for the work of <laughs> bringing you salvation. <laughs> that's not the best foot to start off on, I no. think. Particularly in Achaia, in the, in the areas, Corinth and the areas they're about, he was very adamant that he would not take pay from any of those churches mm -hmm. because there were people who were exactly saying that about him. He's in it for the money, and he wanted to put any occasion for that very far away, but he still took 
as it were, checks from other congregations, as you've said, from people who were far off. Yeah. And so, whereas we can talk about the pastor's attitude, none of us is a pastor, and that's really not where, mm-hmm. where I think we should be coming from. We need we yeah. need to start where we are as members of congregations who are ministered to by our pastors and what the Bible says we need to do. What they need to do, they probably know. Most of them do it faithfully. Every now and then you run into... Um, a couch potato. I just heard a story of somebody who for eight years had been plagiarizing sermons off the internet. Mm. Um, but that's rare, generally. And I know in our circles, most of our pastors work very, very hard, put in a lot of study, as well as doing counseling, Bible studies, confirmation classes, and all sorts of things. And so God has provided a, a way to pay them. Now, having said that, now we back up and and, and people will say, but wait. Tithing, that's... Old Testament, it's a law. It's not something that is required for salvation because salvation is by grace and tithing would be a work. There Did I know it? I think so. Okay. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of things that aren't required for salvation that are still <laughs> necessary. <laughs> yeah. The question is not how we get saved. The question is what we are saved unto. Mm-hmm. Are we saved to be members of a body that supports itself and that needs to, well, eat? You know, someone, if, you, if you've got a cardiac arrest and someone brings you back to life and says, you need food, you don't say, no, I don't. I came back to life for free. Well, wait, you see your hospital bill. But, you know, <laughs> you, you, having come back to life, you need to, you need to be eating and somebody needs to make the meal. And in our world. Uh, even in the hospital world, somebody's going to get paid. So th- that's a matter of confusion. Uh, no, you don't have to tithe to come to Christ. I, I remember talking to some Mormon girls at the uh, door, and they they had been coached really, really well. They 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 dropped all the old Mormon cants and cliches, and were trying to sound very evangelical to the point where I, I finally just said, look, what do you have to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Go to church. Tithe. And they went on. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, that's a different gospel. Mm-hmm. That's not tithing as a fruit of your faith. That's tithing to earn forgiveness. And then we're not talking about that. And anybody who's listening should have figured this one out by now. We're mo- Okay, so we're moving on. Is the, Are there grounds in the New Testament for tithing. Well, the first question I think is, where does tithing start in the Bible? Mm-hmm. It starts with Abraham. It starts before um, God's covenant with Abraham in chapter 15, and then the covenant of circumcision in uh, in 17. It starts Notably, in chapter... Notably, Abraham is before Moses. Can we just... Oh, yes. For those who, do not, who may not know the Bible, <laughs> Abraham is way before Moses. So we're before the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Covenant, but we're even before the Abrahamic Covenant. What we have mm-hmm. is only the gospel promise. Abraham, or God has called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and said, In thee, thy seed, all nations will be blessed. Paul in Galatians 3 calls that a preaching of the gospel. So we have the preaching of the gospel. Abram's responded in faith. And then there's this whole thing where he takes on um, some Canaanite king, or some uh, Mesopotamian kings who've kind of come into Canaan and raided the place. And when he's done and coming back from the slaughter, he meets this strange guy named Melchizedek, uh, of whom we know very little, but we are told this. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hands unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread even to a shoe latch that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made him rich, save only that which my my friends have, have eaten. And there's tithing. He gave him tithes of all. For if you just read that, you wouldn't even be sure who was giving tithes to whom. He blessed him. Again, it, it would be unclear until you read the whole passage in context. 
the writer of Hebrews comes back and, con and comments on the whole thing and makes it really clear that whoever Melchizedek was, and he says it's, it's, it means king of righteousness. It's a title, not a name. So we don't even know the guy's name. He was king of Salem, of peace, Shalom, probably the original Jerusalem. So prince of peace, rule of Jerusalem. Some people have even thought he's Jesus, but he's spoken of in language in Hebrews that suggests he's not, although there's quarrels about that. But whoever he was, he's greater than Abraham on two counts. Melchizedek blesses Abram, and Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek. What does Melchizedek do for Abram? Well, he blesses him, and he brings him bread and wine, which is to say, as a priest of the Most High God, he presents a, the indefinite article is important here, a communion meal, because to eat with God's priest is to eat with God. Now, this is not the Eucharist. This is not the Holy Communion we know as Christians, but it's certainly a foreshadowing of it because it's the same mm -hmm. elements. It's bread and wine. <clears throat> but it's brought by a priest, and Abraham and his men eat with the priest. That's fellowshipping with God's priest, and so with God. And it is to this man who brings the bread and wine and who blesses him that Abraham pays tithes. And here is this word tithe out of nowhere. It means 10%. And as we read through Scripture, we see it's 10% of the increase, not 10% of your capital goods. God's not out to decapitalize his people. But where God blesses us, then out of that increase, beginning here, he tells us he wants 10%. The, um, and Abraham had just got money. He had just raided kings, and although he gave most of it back, apparently he gave 10% of his accumulated winnings to Melchizedek. The next account is in Genesis 28. Here, Jacob, who's Abram's grandson, so now we're, we're still under the Abrahamic covenant, but we haven't got to Moses yet. He's on his way to Syria to find a wife, and as he leaves the, the promised land, he uh, sleeps at a place that he'll call Bethel. And he sees a ladder to heaven and angels going down and up, or up and down, actually. And then God speaks to him, and when Jacob wakes, he's afraid. He names the place Bethel, the house of God, and he promises that when he comes back, he will give God a tenth of all that he's gained. Well, at that point, he's got nothing, a point <laughs> he makes later. Although he's heir to a great fortune, he actually says, I just had my staff, and apparently a bottle of oil for anointing the stone. That's about it. So, again, there's no positive commandment that we know about beforehand, and yet both of these men believed that this was something they ought to do, that they ought to tithe, be taxed upon their increase. And both faithfully did. We've, Jacob, eventually when he comes back, honors Bethel and makes it a place where um, God can be worshipped, and eventually the ark is there for a little while later on, the tabernacle. So this is the pre-Mosaic history of the tithe that we know about. Hmm. We don't know a whole lot else. There are things that the patriarchs knew that they had been told that are not recorded in Scripture. For instance, Noah knew what clean and unclean animals were. There's no record of how he knew that or when God told anybody, but obviously God had. So someplace along the line, well, these men understood that this is what God wanted. Well, how do we know they just didn't make it up? Like, this sounds like a good idea. I once had a pastor tell me that... Um, since there's no positive command in Genesis to sacrifice a lamb, Abel made up the whole sacrificing a lamb thing, and God thought it was a good idea. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> no, that's not the way the Bible works. Human creativity uh, in worship specifically doesn't seem to go well. <laughs> no, it's called will worship, and Paul condemns it rather mm -hmm. soundly in Colossians. So, uh, yeah, this is not will worship. This is not... I'm thinking of a number. The number is uh, left hand 10. Uh, <laughs> because when we do get to the Mosaic Law, it's very clear that 10% is the normal tithe. Even to the point of when you're tithing animals, you stand there with a stick and count them, tap them mm -hmm. one by one as they go by, and you take every 10th animal. Here's a trick question I put on, on tests for my kids. If you have... 22 uh, new sheep, how many do you tithe? And when it's a multiple test question, it's like, A, you know, 
2, B3, 4, 2.2, 5, however the spirit leads you. you know, <laughs> um, well, the answer is you count the first 10 and pick one, and you count the next 10, pick another, and then you're done. But wait, here are these extra sheep. Hasn't God good? He lets you keep stuff. <laughs> um, and, and so throughout uh, the rest of Scripture, a tithe is 10% of the increase. Now, this is not the place or the time. Since, since we're now reaching the end of the Old Testament, this is not the time to go back to the Mosaic Law and look at all the uses of the tithe and <laughs> distinctions people have made. There's uh, Sometimes the tithe was used for celebrating feasts every third year, in, either as a, double, a second tithe or as a specified use of the normal tithe. It went to the poor. Those tell us things about how the Mosaic Law fleshed out the tithe and showed us what it was all about and how it could be used and such. But that's that's not the point because that yeah. is that's wrapped up in the Levitical Law. Uh, would it be sufficient, perhaps, to say the the tithe is a form of first fruits offering? That it is, it is the token amount to say all of this is really God's. That is a very important thing to say, and I thank you for saying it, because I probably would have forgotten. I kind of take it for granted and therefore often forget to <laughs> say it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as Americans, well, with, God wants 10%. No, God wants 100%. <laughs> but he wants you to manage the other 90%. Yeah, he's, he's, he's letting you manage the other 90% for him. He wants 10% of that total to go to his church, to those who bless in his name and who present you with communion. This is why the tithe does not go normally to Christian schools or parachurch organizations mm -hmm. or other things. Those are fine things for the church itself to support. They're fine things for you to support with offerings above and beyond the tithe, because God does demand tithes and offerings. Mm -hmm. But the, the basic 10% needs to go to your pastor and your own church work, because it has immediate needs. And God has judged that 10% should just about cover it. You mentioned earlier that if you have 10 families and they're tithing, then you can support a pastor. Can't support a building on top of that very well. But if you only got 10 families, you can probably meet in someone's house, as the early church often did. It's also interesting that under the Mosaic Law, when judges were apportioned, the lowest grouping was 10 families. So I, th I think there's an argument that at 10 families, a church can become self-supporting. Less than that, you got a mission work, and um, it needs to grow. And after 20 years, you still have a mission work, and it's not growing. People need to be evangelists, or you probably need to defund it, or just let them sink or swim on their own. Well, the thing that I left out of my uh, summary, which I think is very important, is mm -hmm. that Christ is our tithe. Mm. That he is spoken of as the first fruits. Um, he, Excellent. As the first to rise mm -hmm. um, when Christ raised him from the dead, he became the first fruits of them that slept. Meaning all of those who trust in Christ are fully gods. Mm. But he is the first to receive gifts on our behalf. And if that is excellent, and if we undo that, wait, did we say this wasn't a salvation issue? Hmm. <laughs> Everything's a salvation. Everything points to Jesus. Thank you for making that explicit on this one. I had not thought about that in those terms before, although I've heard people kind of talk around it, but not so bluntly as that. I think that's a very, very pertinent observation here. Uh, to say, you know, God doesn't need my 10%. Well, do you need Jesus? Uh, he is representative of the whole. And um, he claims all that we are. And if we can't give the 10% he demands, we're basically saying we don't like God's covenantal arrangement of life or of salvation. And that's that can be a very dangerous thing. Well, when we come to Hebrews, the, uh, the writer starts to mention Melchizedek and says, I got a lot of stuff to say about him, but you're kind of dull and not ready to hear it all. And he goes <laughs> off on a tangent for a while. We think, no, I love no. the author, author of Hebrews. <laughs> But in chapter 7, he comes back and says, all right, here we go. And he, he does tell us what he, he wants us to know. And here's just a little bit of it that's relevant. His, his point here is not to prove the continuation of the tithe, but he it sort of dry, drops out in the process. In uh, verse 4 of chapter 7, Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham 
gave the tenth of the spoils, translating the word tithe for us. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priest should have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abram. But he whose descent is not counted from them, Melchizedek, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here on earth in Israel, men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it's witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes pay tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If their perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaining to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance to the altar. For it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And yet it's far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who's made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, in Psalm 110, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So Abraham, the father of all who believed, paid tithes to Melchizedek, who was greater than the father of all who believe, greater than the Abrahamic covenant, in that sense greater than the Old Testament version of the gospel administration. Jesus picks up where Melchizedek left off. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. If, the, if our father Abraham paid tithes to the lesser Melchizedek, does it not follow that we should pay tithes to the true and greater Melchizedek? And if not, why not? And why don't we want to accept you know, the, the, the two appeals? But that's legalistic. No, it's called obedience. If you love me, keep my commandments. But but I can't... <laughs> my roommate was, when he ran in, in college, when he ran into uh, tithing for the first time, he really struggled with it. He actually called um, Dr. Rush Juni and went to talk to him and said to, to Rush Juni, but... You know, Shannon, I'm a poor student. I can't afford to tithe. <laughs> Rush Jenny says, sounds to me like you can't afford not to tithe. Ding. Sometimes the way to kill the flesh is to demand of it what it can't do. Mm -hmm. So that we're thrown back on grace. We're thrown back on faith. Now, um, you Can I say from a practical perspective, mm -hmm. the 10%... You know how if you're on vacation for a long time and there are no demands on your time, suddenly you you find yourself wondering where it's all going? Mm. I found that money is the same way <laughs> where if suddenly you think, oh my goodness, 10% is a significant portion. Well, it's like, yeah, now you get to figure out how to manage the rest of it <laughs> so that it's enough. Yes. Um, and you'll find that it is enough. <laughs> yeah. I've, yeah. I've also found that, weirdly enough, when I am actively tithing, the other 90% covers more. I don't understand how that works. <laughs> um, yes. But when I'm not, I also realize, oh, wow, th th that just got used up really quick, and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God is um, subtle and sneaky, and he controls the universe <laughs> in ways we don't get, and yeah, I think a lot of people have discovered that. When we are faithful, the money just somehow seems to go further or more easily, or there are less demands on it, or it shows up in the mail. Or so. When we are not, it doesn't seem to matter how much we have. It's never quite enough. Because God keeps his end of things. He's, he's promised that we will have enough to eat and to drink and to keep ourselves closed. And, and and then ultimately that's enough, and yet he goes far beyond that so often. He generally lets us have houses, which is kind of nice, even with air conditioning. Malachi, speaking at the same time that Nehemiah was ministering, said, Will a man rob God? Did you have robbed me? But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food 
for my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, if there shall not be room to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time of the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Tithes and offerings, God expects us to, to generously support the work of the church. The parallel book in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians, where Paul spends a lot of time talking about the need to give and how God loves um, a cheerful giver. So you want to be led by the Spirit? Well, let's look at it this way. If the law, with all of its limitations and perfections, only demanded 10%, surely the Spirit will lead you to give less? <laughs> Probably not. Demands for the work of the gospel are great. And it's not an accident that as we come to the end of the Old Testament, both in the, the prophetic books and in the historical books, um, tithing reasserts itself. Uh, God promises a blessing. And if the king work of the kingdom is to be forward in our generation, the money's got to come from someplace. And sometimes we just are a little too entitled. Even those of us who think of ourselves as poor, sometimes are just a little too entitled, thinking we deserve all this. All our friends have all this. Why shouldn't we? And God does not um, ask us to give up all the good things of life. There's a series of sermons you could do out of Ecclesiastes on that little thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet... He does want us to give generously, particularly to those things he lays in our heart, where we see opportunities where we're involved. But Paul says, um, speaking of one group of saints, they gave not as we hope, but first they gave of them own, their own selves. So personal involvement, prayers, thoughtful, wise, intentional giving, this is part of what it means for the gospel to advance. And yes, it is so. Not Gnostic. Ding. Ding. I don't know where my bell is. <laughs> that it's that it's a bit amazing. The alternative to financing God's kingdom is, well, anyone look at their income tax bill lately? Uh, mm. <laughs> don't remind me. Yeah. Samuel said that when the king starts asking for more than 10%, he's a tyrant. Well, we passed that a long time ago. So mm -hmm. a step backward into freedom and responsibility is to pick up Tithing again, yes, in the face of the go government's confiscatory taxes and rebuild in terms of the Christian faith. And that means spending money on churches and missionary activity and Christian schools and orphanages and pro-life centers and Christian books and, and you name it. Um, lots to do before Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the topic of tithing comes in so heavily at the end of the Old Testament as we're closing out both our series and our our look at the Old Testament? Uh, this is a guess because I, I had just thought about it a little before you asked the question and then something new sparked in my head as you asked. This is a time when Israel is under the heel of a foreign power. And the Persian kings initially were very nice to Israel and actually funded the temple building and a number of other things. Israel wasn't always responsible with the money they got, but it was there for a while. But as we go on into the time between the Testaments, there's nobody making God's people tithe. Here, Nehemiah, he's a civil governor. Mm -hmm. He's not the pastor. And yet he's, he's enforcing quite a forceful the personality. <laughs> yes, he is. And he has his priorities right. And he's he sees the need here and he pushes it. But as we go beyond that, it's it's gonna become more and more up to God's people to be self-governed and to tithe on their own if they want to have any kind of godly local self-government, if they want to have pastors and teachers and synagogues. They're going to have to fund this. The, the Persians and certainly the Greeks and the Romans aren't going to do it. So this is as we're as we're stretching out of the economy where the Davidic kings took care of everything, and then the Gentile kings for a little while. Where I think we're being shown this is how it's got to be, and in that sense, it's it is a message for the New Testament church because the new the, the people God's people in the, in the um, restoration covenant 
are foreshadowing of the church. Mm-hmm. I mean, no political support, no political presence, scattered throughout the world, meeting on the Sabbath day, receiving sermons, reading the Bible, chanting chanting psalms, praying, witnessing to their Gentile neighbors, trying to bring in Gentiles into the flock, and waiting for Messiah. And you can add to that, with no financial support, the only way this is going to work is if they tithe. And with the New Testament church, it's almost identical. But what Israel was being taught in the Restoration is an operator's manual for the New Testament church from from the beginning until now. We still don't have the civil government supporting us, and I'm not sure I want them to, (laughs) um, because there are always strings with that. But that's my the best things that they shot. support don't tend to turn out very well. No, um, does it fit also with a concept of the Old Testament church growing in maturity to where you know, it becomes these mundane details? You know, we start off with mm-hmm. the flood and the Red Sea and you know fireworks and special effects, right? And then suddenly, well, not suddenly, very gradually, we come to the restoration, and it's and this is how you pay your bills on time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, when you're in kindergarten, you don't pay bills. Um, dad, ma- dad and mommy just make food and ice cream and pony rides materialize out of nowhere. Isn't it great? <laughs> and then someplace around 19, 20, 21, it's, wait, you mean I have to pay for this? I don't even have a job. Well, not a very, you know, what do we used That's to call That's a them? problem Mixed you could have three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You should have been thinking ahead. Um Sometimes uh, young people are a little slow to pick up on that, and often the church is a little slow. Where are the miracles? You don't need no miracles. You need to make use of the means that God has given you. They are sufficient. Um, and in in this respect, with all due respect to our charismatic friends, sometimes the charismatic movement is has been kind of a step back toward immaturity. We want the signs and wonders. Well, yes, we do, as a matter of fact. It's not that, that Reformed Presbyterians don't want those things. <laughs> it's just, you know, sometimes you you you, you want to go lick that lollipop or that ice cream cone <laughs> uh, or go sliding down the water slide. But, you know, it's not, that's not what life is made of anymore. <laughs> we, uh, there are regular duties, responsibilities, predictable things that we have to do. And as you say, paying the bills. The kingdom of God is one of them. And it's mundane and it's unexciting. And sometimes it requires you to sit up a couple hours later and do some math to make sure you know how this is going to work. But this is part of faithful living in God's kingdom. Any closing thoughts, Brian? I had some thoughts earlier, and I neglected to write down notes (laughs) so that I could mention them when there was a lull in conversation. Um, You should have known. There's never a lull. We're, how many episodes? That's a very in? good point. There's yeah, never a little. <laughs> I, I haven't learned. Um, I think the only thing I would add is that I think a large, at least one large part of the innate instinct to eschew tithing does come from the overemphasis we see on from people such as prosperity teachers mm-hmm. um, or even from hometown preachers who simply put too much emphasis on it, maybe because <laughs> the budget didn't balance the way they wanted to that year. <laughs> but um, And it's a question of how you teach it, not how much you teach it as well, right? Oh, yes, for certain. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm sure you could do a sermon series on tithing and not come across as a money grubber or a... Um, <laughs> legalist but yeah it doesn't doesn't change the fact that this is a this is a good thing it's the way that one of the ways god has instituted to take care of the church which includes not just the pastor but also all acts of mercy ministry that the church engages in Mm -hmm. um the care of widows and orphans which uh james calls true religion activism in some sense anyway um, things like that. Those are all proper ministry venues for, or avenues for the church to engage in. And most of them you can't do without money. Uh, there's some things you can 
you can squeeze by uh, <laughs> with some elbow grease and uh, old two by fours that are in someone's <laughs> garage. But for the most part, you need money. Um, and that's not a it's not a um, crude calling to engage in funding the church in this way. It is a simple sign of faithfulness, I think, uh, which. Yeah, like like we said, there there may even be seasons, I think, where it is not possible for a particular family to engage in tithing, but it should be the goal to get back to it as soon as possible. Yeah, a practical example there, we had a lady in our church who was dying of cancer, and it she died over a long period of time because she yeah. really fought it because she wanted... She had a ministry um, taking smuggling Bibles into uh, blocked countries, and she really wanted to get back there. And she was just, you know, kind of wrestling with God over it. And so she was doing every treatment she could, not to hang on to life for its own sake, but because she wanted to minister. And it consumed their income. They, they were wise. They, they they drew limits and said, "We're not going to spend so much money that." But it came to the point where you know people were giving her money to support her, and they turned and said, "So." We should still be tithing, right? <laughs> and our church said, "You know what? You don't have the increase." <laughs> <at> <laughs> there's that no, point, there's right? no increase here. No, yeah. don't. You don't. You don't need to be tithing. We'll just God. God knows what's going on here. It's all right. The way um, you talked about that, Brian, it kind of sounded like this is the bride of Christ practicing self care. <laughs> 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 Actually, though, um, that's not that's not too inaccurate. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is a a very real sense in which the spirit works through these practical means. Um, there is the office of deacon for a reason, yeah. um, which is to assist with the practical needs and concerns and, well, needs and concerns, really, of its church members beyond just the quote unquote strictly spiritual needs like the gospel, weekly sermons, the Lord's Supper. We're still flesh and blood creatures. We need food. And sometimes the only way you get that is is from from the deacon board helping you out. I know that last year, um and this is a, a, a much less dire situation, but last year we lost power during a summer thunderstorm uh actually a lot of the city lost power but um we lost all the food in our fridge and we were very much not super solvent at the time it was it was kind of it would, it would have been a hit to replace the food that was in there and we approached our deacon board at our church and they I think it took them like four days because that was when their next deacon meeting was. But they mm -hmm. said, all right, here's a gift card to Aldi. You can go and replace all your food. And Aldi's super inexpensive and we get most of our food there anyway. So it's like, okay, we're replacing <laughs> the things that were already in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just, yeah, that's just one of the ways that God provides for his people. And like you said, sometimes you you tighten the belt a bit more in order to be able to tithe and things work out in a different way than you would have expected that don't make mm -hmm. sense. They don't make naturalistic sense. Yeah. Um, in a sense, the deacon board is a naturalistic sense-making thing. <laughs> but um, in another way, it's not. It's very it's a it's a spiritual thing that is happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, shall we? Wrap up with some recommendations? I think so. All right. I can go first if you want me Good. to. Great. Right. Go, go first. first. <laughs> um, mine, mine is kind of two-parted. I'm going to recommend uh, your local library. Hmm. Um, in In particular, uh, today I went to return something at my library. Also, you should check out what your library actually lets you check out because <laughs> besides books... Uh, and I don't know how many libraries do things like this, but ours here in the area, they have the most interesting additional things you can check out. Like uh, I checked out last week, I think it was a a baking cookware 
tray kind of thing <laughs> that was honeycomb shaped with like little bee imprints. It's for cakes. I tried making scones and it didn't work very well as far as keeping the shape. But um that's just fun. You should you should yeah. go look and see what kind of things your your local library lets you uh lets you check out. But today when I was returning that, I also found that they had a whole a whole shelf for new cookbooks. And so <laughs> <laughs> me being the baker and mixologist of our house, I found uh one on European baking, two books on cocktails and one on pasta making that's thicker than any of the other ones uh, <laughs> so that'll be that'll be my reading for the next two weeks is to just kind of absorb all of this the super interesting information and i guess the trident i'll make it a three-point thing um <laughs> is like look into like you should explore things that you're passionate about and and learn about <laughs> because god has made a world that is vibrant and full of interesting things enough for the six billion seven billion people that live on it to find something that interests them uh and that's really cool like um one of one of the people one of the families that i'm connected to i just found out last month i thought he was retired he goes around and he sells bacterial treatments for like public not public, uh, private ponds on mm. dairy farms to <laughs> treat, to get rid of harmful bacteria and things that come from cow dung. And he makes a good living doing that. And you, I never would have guessed that this was a career or <laughs> a job that existed. And it does, because that's yeah. just how complex and interesting the world is. So anyway, those are my multiple points. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to recommend a a different podcast. I guess I guess it's probably available as a podcast. I have obtained it on YouTube. Um, it's a series from Jordan Peterson and a bunch of friends talking through line by line the Book of Exodus. Whoa! Yeah, and it's a huge panel discussion. Like Dennis Prager is on it. Jonathan Pajot, um, uh Who's the other guy? Oz Guinness. There's mm. a bunch of people, some others that I, I had mm. not heard of before. Um, but it's, it's pretty it's cool. Very cool. Very cool to listen to. And there's, it's it's just full of good stuff. You know, the Dennis Prager always, whenever he talks about religion, I'm like, my dude, you just, uh, no, <laughs> stop. <laughs> um, but it's really cool to see the back and forth between him and the others who are coming from a variety of backgrounds and um, faiths. But I love to watch all of these very intelligent people submitting themselves to the word of God for the sake of understanding it. Because really, when you approach a text, if you're going to understand it, you have to take it on his own terms. Yes. I think C.S. Lewis talks about that, right? In, yeah. uh, I forget what work. Well, something about criticism. No? I was saying criticism. I don't know. I will have to look that up. Anyway, C.S. Lewis talks about how you have to take a work of literature on its own terms. So whether or not any of these individuals submits in faith to Jesus Christ as the subject of the book of Exodus, they are all submitting to the book of Exodus in some fashion. And it's there's just lots of fruit coming out. I'm enjoying it very much. Excellent. Now, if we could just get someone on that panel who actually understood Exodus. <laughs> be nice mm. anyway not to say that they don't have some understanding especially mm -hmm. i would think os guinness would know a lot but mm -hmm. he's had some really good input yeah anyhow um i i'm going to recommend an old bbc series called um sherlock holmes starring jeremy brett I've just picked up the fact that Disney's The Great Mouse Detective named its Sherlock main character Basil as a reference. <laughs> I didn't I never knew that. That's amazing. That's such a good movie. It is. Radigan is legitimately terrifying. Yeah. Uh it's done period. It's uh Jeremy Brett plays a pretty much thoroughly unlikable Sherlock Holmes, but a man you have to respect. Mm. 
which is how Holmes ought to be played pretty much. Uh, it's uh, And of course, Dr. Watson's likable as Dr. Watson is always likable. <laughs> But it's done um, straight. It's done. It's done well. It's done by people who appreciate the original stories and and copy from them almost verbatim. Uh, if you've never seen it and you want an older original take on the Sherlock Holmes short stories, this is it. It's it's fantastic. So there we go. Great. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. And thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, dear listener, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting toward Zion, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash halting toward Zion. And I will remind us once again that toward without an S at the end is the American spelling. So that's what we're using. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, send us a recommendation of your own. You can send us an email at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.